singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show, you can help me make it better in one of several ways. You can go and write a brief review on iTunes, you can leave a comment on the blog, or you can simply make a donation. As always, I will be the man with the questions, and today the guest with the answers will be David Pierce. David is a British utilitarian philosopher who promotes what he calls the hedonistic imperative. He is also the co-founder of the World Transhumanist Association and a vegan who argues that we, or our future post-human descendants, have a responsibility not only to avoid cruelty to animals within human society, but also to alleviate the suffering of animals in the wild. So, hi David, I'm very happy to have you on my show. Hi Nicola, it's good to hear from you. Hello everyone. (laughs) Fantastic. So... David, if you were to introduce yourself in your own words, how would you do it? Good heavens. Um, Well, I don't really do a a great deal other than talk and write. Uh, In one sense, I'm already uh, exceeding my design limitations. Uh, But uh, yes, essentially what I write about is the use of biotechnology to phase out suffering, uh, not just in humans, but uh, in non-human animals too. Uh, this the uh, the the goal of uh, phasing out suffering, of course, is not not itself uh, new. One can trace it back to uh, Buddha, Buddhism, for instance. But what's different now in the twenty first century is that it's possible to uh, at least outline how it's technically feasible. Um, and uh, yes, one has to be very careful. Uh, simply because something is technically feasible, this doesn't mean it's actually going to happen. Uh, but there are tentative grounds uh, for outlining how it, it really will come to pass. So let me, before we get to the specifics of how you propose that we alleviate suffering, let me ask you about philosophy. How and where does it fit in your life? And what was the story, perhaps, that, that you fell in love with philosophy? How did you come to become a, a, a philosopher? I think more than anything else, philosophy is a matter of temperament. Uh, one can have someone who is extraordinarily uh, bright and intelligent, but simply has no appetite for questions that sound philosophical. Uh, equally, there are people who just by nature have the philosopher's temperament. They tend to be depressive, brooding, uh, introspective. This is a, a rather sweeping statement. Um, I, sh- I should add that though, yes, uh, well, I suppose I might call myself a, a philosopher, I think that philosophy that is untutored by science and the sciences is likely to be uh, bad philosophy. Um, Having said that, uh, I I, I think science that does not at least take some interest in philosophy is not thereby going to transcend philosophy, but simply give bad philosophical assumptions a free pass. Um, Mm -hmm. But but how did you get to be uh, exposed to philosophy? Was it in school? Did you read a philosopher uh, at some point in your life? Or what was your sort of entry point? (laughs) <laughs> well, it would be nice to report at the age of 13 or something like that, I stumbled across uh, Kant's critique of p- pure reason or something and never looked back. No, I think I was probably about 12 or 13 and I picked up on a new station uh, bookstore, a little book called Philosophy Made Simple. Um, and uh, uh, embarrassing to say, that was the first book of philosophy I, I, I ever read. Uh, <laughs> but I think... Uh... From humble beginnings, we get uh, to to great ends. So uh, the beginning is not important. The journey is and how far we're willing to take it, right? Uh, Yes, uh, I'm inclined to think so. Um, Perhaps just I I would add, too, that although I happen to be a utilitarian, it's possible to favor phasing out the biology of suffering, regardless of whether you're uh, any kind of utilitarian. You could be a deontologist, a pluralist, uh, uh, a a Christian. Uh, All it takes, I think, is this very uh, minimal ethical commitment to phase out involuntary suffering. So no one need uh, feel they need to sign up 
to utilitarian ethics to support the abolitionist project. But why did you pick utilitarianism as your favorite flavor of philosophy? What was it that attracted you? What was it for you that grabbed you, inspired you perhaps? Mm. I think it's the it's the combination of of compassion uh, and rationality. What that would now be called rational altruism. Uh, clearly, my own uh, uh, suffering and those uh, uh, the suffering of those I loved and care about loomed large in my life. But I also took very seriously from science the the the, the, the so called view from nowhere. The idea that uh, uh, it, it is completely an illusion that one is the uh, the center of the universe, and if my suffering is is bad for me, I infer that suffering anywhere for anyone is bad. Uh, and uh, yes, ra- uh, utilitarianism in that sense is is systematized compassion. Mm-hmm. And where does veganism fit into the picture, and how? Mm-hmm. Um, it's back to the uh, 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 the, rash- the, the rationality again. Uh, it's very natural to contrast uh, humans uh, and non-human animals in the way it was once very natural to uh, contrast white uh, Christian gentlemen with, uh, with with primitive savages. Uh, but all the evidence, convergence of evidence from neuroscience evolutionary biology neurophysiology suggests that non-human animals the ones you know pigs and so on are as as as, as sentient and as sapient as pre-linguistic uh toddlers uh and we treat non-human animals in the way that if if a human were to treat a pre-linguistic toddler in the way we treat pigs for instance that that the perpetrator would be locked up for life Mm -hmm. uh and it is in that sense, is I won't argue here for anyone who says, uh, let's say, a moral anti-realist who says there's nothing wrong with abusing or, or, or killing toddlers. But assuming we take that as read that it is profoundly abhorrent to, to harm human toddlers, I would say it is profoundly abhorrent to uh, to, to harm non-human animals. Uh, instead of harming them and exploiting them, uh, we should be thinking of ways to help and look after them. So at what point in your life did you start thinking about uh, being becoming a vegan? And, and why? Was there a particular event that triggered that line of thinking? Uh, well, actually, uh, I'm a third generation vegetarian. Grandparents on both sides were vegetarian, which is probably... Wow. Uh, unique uh, to the uh, the West, but this is a, an accident of birth rather than the signature of uh, of great uh, virtue uh, on my part. Um, but yes, clearly that uh, uh, background, my parents uh, uh, were uh, 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 Christians, I should add, uh, must have contributed to my early development. One of my earliest memories was trying to uh, uh, rescue uh, little ants that uh, small, cruel, small boys had uh, had trodden on uh, that must have been about the age of four or five um, but uh, uh, so yes I said it's very difficult clearly to understand fully one's own intellectual antecedents but that clearly was a contributing factor mm-hmm. so you've been a vegan since birth oh no I've been a, uh, I was a vegetarian since birth uh, vegan much more recently about seven or eight years ago um, so you've never had meat in your life no, I, I would not recognize the taste of meat, no. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. So, now, you were talking about the the fact that pre-linguistic toddlers uh, probably exhibit the same level of sentience such as, say, adult pigs, uh, which we slaughter for food on our, you know, industrial scale. Uh, can you define your threshold for sentience and how do you measure it? Um, it is clearly harder to give an accurate quantitative measure of, uh, for instance, suffering in pre-linguistic humans and non-human animals. But what one can do is operationalize the notion and and uh, investigate how hard either a, a human or a non-human animal will work to obtain or avoid a particular stimulus. So in that sense, it's possible to uh, uh, quantify pleasure and pain. 
Also, one can uh, in investigate this down to the molecular uh, level. There are, I mean, to take one example, there is a particular uh, gene, the SCN9A gene. Nonsense mutations induce complete insensitivity to pain. Other mutations uh, induce either very high or a very low pain threshold. And so, yes, one can investigate. And if one looks at pigs and uh, toddlers, one finds that the molecular pathways and the genes and the gene expression profi profiles implicated in, our, uh, in pain, pleasure, and, the raw, and our raw emotions uh, are almost identical. What distinguishes uh, humans uh, uh, from non-human animals is, in many cases, extraordinarily uh, 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 subtle at the genetic and molecular level. Mm -hmm. But how do we know that that huge genetic overlap would be sufficient to translate into sentience proper? Uh, one can't defeat radical skepticism. I mean, the only person one will ever know for sure uh, uh, is, is conscious is oneself. But it, it seems a reasonable inference to the best explanation to assume this. After all, science is based uh, on the principle of the uniformity of nature. Mm -hmm. I infer that you feel profound distress because if you catch your hand in the door, uh, uh, your behavior is similar to that of me or a pig. The molecular processes at work in your mind brain uh, seem to be nearly identical. What distinguishes you or, or me from the pig, or for that matter, the pre-linguistic toddler, uh, number of things, but in particular, it's, uh, uh, the, it's our capacity for generative syntax. Uh, uh, and there's very little evidence that this capacity for generative syntax uh, is bound up with degree of sentience. After all, if you ask me how was it that I produced the sentence I'm doing now, which no one has ever uttered in the history of the world before, it's opaque to introspection. Uh, it's, <laughs> very, very, it's very, very subtle and elusive, the ph phenomenology of thought. I think most of us have this implicitly this idea of the great chain of being with humans more intensely conscious than, 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 than any other creature. But if you actually look at consciousness, uh, it's the most primitive forms, pain, uh, uh, fear, disgust, and so on, that are the most intense, whereas the most uh, cerebral, you know, ability to solve differential equations or, or generate complex sent, uh, uh, sentences are actually the thinnest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my uh, audience member asks this, is there such a thing as vegan since we are ingesting so much bacteria every minute? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the critical distinction is that uh, bacteria are, to the best of our knowledge, not subjects uh, of experience. And I think what... Uh, so in that sense, I don't think one needs to worry about the ethical status of bacteria, of, of, of lettuces, or, and much more controversially, uh, I, I don't think a digital computer is a subject of experience either. Um, but uh, yes, it's not a matter of, of, of personal purity. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of not ha causing harm to fellow subjects of experience. Have a, have a, yeah. We're going to come back to the question of computers, but let me let me move up the ladder here and ask you: How about fish? Uh, if you look at, for example, the molecular substrates of of, of panic and terror and pain in a fish, they are extraordinarily similar to that of a human being. Now, it seems unlikely that. Uh, uh, that fish, for instance, have some metacognitive capacity for reflective self-awareness. But on the other hand, if you're in a state of uh, blind terror or panic or, or agony, neither do you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what about in vitro meat? Would you, would you, I mean, it probably shouldn't even be called meat because it's in vitro. Mm -hmm. uh, would you consider that a potential for your vegetarian diet? Um, though personally I have no craving for meat, uh, I am extremely enthusiastic about the potentiality uh, of in vitro meat because unfortunately there is no argument against moral apathy. Um, uh, one can argue to one's blue in the face, but in the end, at the end of the day many people will uh, just shrug their shoulders and say, but I like the taste of meat. 
Um, now, one wouldn't consider this uh, uh, a satisfactory rationalization of child abuse, whether it should be considered a, a, a satisfactory rationalization of animal abuse is another question. But if we are really to have global veganism or in vitrotarianism, I think it is essential to uh, further develop and commercialize in vitro meat. Uh, and one definition of transhumanism, if, if, if you like, is technical solution to ethical problems. Now, uh, I suspect you might be skeptical that most people would be prepared to make uh, the transition to something as unnatural as in vitro meat. But recall it's not or it needn't be genetically engineered. Uh, and in many ways, it's in inverted commas more natural uh, than today's factory farmed uh, pro products from, from live animals. So, yes, I think there is going to be an in vitro meat uh, revolution. And once, for the most part, we have uh, made the transition, I think uh, our grandchildren are going to be appalled and incredulous that we could have treated sentient beings in the way we did. Mm -hmm. But would you consider consuming it yourself? I would have absolutely no ethical problems, whether at a purely cul culinary level I would like it, I don't know. I would have no ethical qualms about uh, So you're open it. to trying it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the most common uh, uh, inquiry at, uh, at New Harvest, uh, which pioneered uh, research uh, into in vitro meat, believe it or not, is people inquiring whether it will be possible to prepare human flesh in this way. So uh, though it, uh, cannibalism wouldn't personally be to my taste, I, I don't have uh, any qualms other than aesthetic qualms for people who want to try it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David, you are the co-founder of the World's Transhumanist Association. So let me ask you, uh, you just said that I was going to ask you to define transhumanism for us. So do you want to stick with transhumanism is a technical solution for ethical problems? Is that um, the best definition? <laughs> uh, I suppose a, a standard one sentence uh, definition uh, would involve the use of technology to overcome our biological limitations. And I think it's very useful just as a mnemonic to have, if you like, the, th the three S's. Uh, uh, transhumanists believe in, uh, in super intelligence, super longevity, and my particular focus, uh, super happiness, super, super well-being. Uh, uh, once again, any little slogan like that is going to be a gross simplification. Uh, but uh, yes, it's a, perhaps a useful mnemonic. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of sounds to me almost like supermanism, super everything. <laughs> a lot of supers, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> super longevity, super, you know, intelligence, etc. Uh, now, is it fair to say that mainstream philosophy has largely ignored transhumanism for the past 30 years or so? Uh, yes, I think that is uh, uh, quite a fair description. I, I, I won't attempt to give a lightning synopsis of the history of uh, analytic philosophy for the past 30, 30 odd years or so. Well, I can if you I can if you want. Um, but uh, yes, uh, transhumanist themes have not been central uh, to mainstream philosophy. Why um, do you think that's the case? Hi. Uh, <laughs> Part of the reason, I think, is that in the second half of the 20th century, mainstream academic analytic philosophy became quite estranged uh, from developments uh, in science, uh, partly under the influence of the later Wittgenstein and uh, the Oxford School of Philosophy. Uh, and this is slowly changing, but, but only uh, uh, slowly changing. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, Nick, Nick Bostrom, whom I co-founded the World Transhumanist Association with, as you know, is now uh, a professor in Oxford, which uh, 20 years ago uh, would be absolute, absolutely unthinkable. Uh, the home of ordinary language philosophy uh, now has a future, a future of humanity institute. <laughs> yes. Uh, so do you think we're making ground here? Yes, I, th I, I think so. Uh, but uh, inevitably, uh, 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 progress is slow. <laughs> what do you say to people who say that transhumanism is kind of very 
British and libertarian in character. I mean, uh, Nick Bostrom, yourself, Max Moore, for example, some of the most notable figures in transhumanism nowadays are all British and uh, allegedly libertarian. Um, Max Moore would certainly fall under the category of the libertarian wing. I'm uh, very much on the, the, uh, the, the dripping left liberal wing, shall we say, of, <laughs> of, 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 of transhumanism. Um, yes, I, I think if, if I, ha uh, let's say, was uh, uh, born in the uh, Soviet Union, old Soviet Union, for instance, I might have a very different perspective, but my gut instincts uh, are those of the left. As I said, gut instincts, uh, it's not uh, generally very fruitful to draw this simple uh, left-right uh, uh, line, but, uh, but transhumanism spans the traditional left-right uh, uh, divide. But the, so if we can call it at all, the British school is kind of predominant, if you will, is that? I would, if, if you look at the, the state of, of, of contemporary transhumanism, um, sing, singularitarianism, for instance, rather the Kurtzweilian variety mm -hmm. or, the, uh, or the Miri variety uh, is not distinctively British. Uh, Aubrey de Grey, who has done more than anyone else to to rescue uh, super longevity from yep. a crank from crank alley to serious science, yes, he is uh, 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 British, and uh, yes, as you can probably tell from my accent, I I'm I'm a Brit myself, <laughs> but uh, uh, I wouldn't describe transhumanism as a distinctly uh, British phenom uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly has a strong Anglo-American influence, but. Mm -hmm. uh, now, some of the most uh, best-known uh, transhumanists that I know in person here in North America are all uh, following the paleo diet. <laughs> How do you feel about that as a vegan? Max Moore, for example, Natasha Vitamore, I know James Hughes and, and uh, George Dvorsky. Uh, generally, the North American school transhumanists that I know of, they're pretty much almost without exception that I can think of, of followers of the paleo diet. Mm. Well, back to the Paleolithic is not a distinctively transhumanist uh, <laughs> uh, 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 slogan. Um, uh, I think, once again, the fact that vegetarians statistically tend to uh, record higher IQ schools, they tend to be slimmer, they tend to be uh, longer-lived um, I'm very skeptical that this shows that uh, uh, vegetarianism is, is the healthier diet, though it may be. But it, it, it does illustrate that if there are really benefits to a meat-based paleo diet, they must be extraordinarily uh, uh, marginal. Let um, me push you on that claim a little bit, though, because... Um I was reading a number of studies that were comparing um, huge slices of the Indian population where you have something like 300 or almost 400 uh, vegetarians. And uh, those people were not exhibiting any less diabetes, any less heart disease than their contemporary uh, meat-eating uh, Western uh, counterparts. Uh, and furthermore, um, development with respect to IQ, of course, is very much uh, related to the brain development. And uh, there's a lot of studies that show that uh, children who do not uh, receive sufficient amount of uh, zinc, uh, iron, magnesium, and a bunch of other uh, elements in their diet, which are readily found in meat, tend to have generally stinted uh, brain development, which uh, can never be overcome after a certain point. Uh, in other words, if you have a child born in, in, in Africa in, in, in a culture or in a situation of uh, near famine, where they, are, they only have access to grains, for example, uh, they there's a large proportion of the population which would suffer stinted uh, brain development, given the lack of vitamins, proper uh, minerals, etc. Um, yes, I mean, a, a grain-based diet, for instance, would 
put one uh, uh, at risk of uh, tryptophan deficiency, for example. Other things being equal, it is it is safer from a purely self-interested point of view to be a, a, a lazy uh, meat eater to uh, a, a lazy ve- uh, lazy vegan. All I'm trying to do is is suggest that any differences at all must be extraordinarily uh, uh, subtle. Uh, 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 for this to be the case. Now, it's rather different in, let's say, Africa, when certainly the capacity, when the opportunity uh, arose in our ancestral past to eat meat, human or non-human, was, uh, was, was, was fitness enhancing. Um, but the question is today, when uh, it's essentially a lifestyle choice, whether one uh, chooses to harm other sentient beings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because to tell you the truth, for me, personally speaking, I accept sort of the ethical uh, impetus behind being a vegan. But uh, with respect to health, I am very much not convinced that that's a, that's a healthy choice. And yes, perhaps if you, if you are what you call a non-lazy vegan, in other words, you have to be meticulous about... Um, supplementing with all the the supplements like iron zinc etc but if you do that that in itself shows that vegan diet is not diet which is evolutionarily adapted to our own bodies Mm. Um, so it it puts your your health at risk i i don't think there's any evidence that being a careful vegan puts one health one's health at risk being a lazy vegan uh, most certainly does. Very different simply being a, a vegetarian. Uh, uh, an egg, for instance, nutritionists regard that as the uh, ideal food, the only thing, uh, yeah. the, nutritionally ideal, the only thing uh, uh, egg lacks is, is vitamin C. So yes, I would uh, advise anyone contemplating becoming a strict vegan to uh, mug up on nutrition first. You need to make sure you're getting a, a good source of uh, vitamin B12. Vegetarianism, though, any any claim of uh, nutritional deficits is 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 is, is completely overblown. Mm-hmm. David, we spend a lot of time on on uh, diets, uh, and of course the reason for that was not nutritional, but but ethical, because uh, I wanted to sort of give us a better perspective of where you're coming from and and what's your sort of ethical outlook on the world. Uh, which I believe has a lot to do, of course, with the work that you do, uh, starting with the abolitionist uh, project, uh, which aims to create a world without suffering. So would you mind uh, telling us about about that, please? Mm. Uh, Yes. Uh, Essentially, thanks to biotechnology, and let's just start with, with humans, it should be possible to phase out both psychological and physical pain, Uh, not just overnight, uh, but over the long term. Uh, And one of the clearest ways that we can start uh, uh, consists of the coming uh, reproductive revolution of what is sometimes known as designer babies. Um, Even now, if you wanted to do so before having children, you could use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to ensure that your future child has a high pain threshold and also a very high hedonic set point. By high hedonic set point, uh, I mean, if you think of the analogy of, of a thermostat, some people are temperamentally gloomy and depressive. Their mood may fluctuate a little, but they have a very dark conception of life. Other mm-hmm. people, their hedonic set point is is, is, is much, much higher. Uh, and one of the things uh, that choosing a, a high hedonic set point for your future child does, it loads the dice in your, in your child's favor. It, if you have a high hedonic set point, it's still possible to retain uh, critical insight. You're still going to have information set, sensitive gradients of well-being, uh, but nonetheless, your quality of life uh, is likely to be much higher. For example, and here's, here's just one example. The, uh, the Compt gene has, has, has two alleles, one of which is uh, associated with a high hedonic set point, the other with a low hedonic set point, uh, mm-hmm. which, if you had the choice, 
would you choose for your future child or would you prefer the traditional genetic crapshoot? Um, <laughs> now, uh, now that's, this isn't even genetic engineering. This is just pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. But as a result of decoding the human genome uh, over the next few decades, it's possible, uh, it's going to be possible to actually have designer genomes. And instead of mere genetic tweaking, it's going to be possible to re-edit uh, the human genome, uh, uh, choosing personality variables, hedonic set point. Um, and clearly it is speculative, the nature of selection pressure in a world where instead of having blind natural selection based on random mutations and not foresight, instead uh, a, a, an era of selection pressure in which prospective parents are choosing the genetic makeup of their prospective children in anticipation of the likely characteristics. But not merely do I think it is ethically desirable that pre-implantation genetic diagnosis becomes the norm. Um, uh, I, 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 I think that there is some evidence that at least that it is actually likely to happen. Once again, this is speculative simply because one can say something is technologically uh, feasible. It, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. But just as something like, like cystic fibrosis, for instance, if you do, uh, if, if, if pre-implantation genetic diagnosis does become the, the norm, no one is going to choose a cystic fibrosis allele for their, their, their future child. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it, its future is bleak, uh, the, very, you know, the cystic fibrosis alleles. But I would argue the same is true of genes predisposing to low mood, depression, anxiety disorders, some of our nastier characteristics that were fitness enhancing in the ancestral environment, uh, but won't be in the new selective regime. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, let, let me ask you a little bit about suffering here. You mentioned in the beginning, in passing about your own suffering. Would you mind telling us a little more about that by any chance? Uh, as uh, uh, I think Andre Gromyko once said, my personality does not interest me. Um, that would be an, <laughs> an, an, an overstatement in, in, in my case. And I've certainly uh, witnessed a fair bit of, of, of suffering in, uh, in, in, in my time. Um, and as I said, the, the only thing that is, is, is really uh, different is, is the technology that now makes it optional, I would say. But wouldn't you say that that suffering has led you to become who you are today in a way and, and get into the whole issue of alleviating suffering, <laughs> right? Maybe if you didn't suffer, you wouldn't have been trying to create uh, any of your work which aims at alleviating or abolishing suffering entirely. Yeah, well, that is one way I can, I suppose, rationalize suffering, but... Um, one thing perhaps it's worth uh, stressing uh, is that one knows from silicon robots, for instance, they can have the functional analogs of agony or anxiety and all the rest of it. Um, and why can't organic robots do the same? So uh, when one talks about abolishing suffering, whether physical or mental, it should be possible to retain the functional analogs of our existing unpleasant states without the nasty raw feels. Um, I'm not convinced we want to retain even the functional analogues of something like uh, uh, jealousy, but in the case of something like physical pain or anxiety for the foreseeable future, it's clearly highly desirable that we retain this functionality. And is it is it technically possible? Because uh, the the general sort of historical perspective on this stemming both from western philosophy and from say buddhism is that it comes as part and parcel of, of the whole package it's it's basically uh i think it was socrates who said something like no pleasure no pain mm -hmm. so if you know pleasure you would therefore also know pain and you cannot know one without the other it's like the Buddhists would say it's like left and right, up and down, something or nothing. You have to have one to have the other. You cannot have up without having down. How can you have pleasure without ever having pain? 
it's a very powerful intuition, this, uh, this contrast effect. However, one only needs to consider today how th- tragically there are some people who endure chronic uh, depression or chronic pain. And it would be extraordinarily cruel to tell them, ah, you can't really uh, be suffering because you've no uh, way of contrasting it with bliss. I mean, recall there are some severe depressives who not merely are they never happy, they don't even know what the word happiness means. I mean, it's, it's, it's that severe. Um, and now for evolutionary reasons, uh, it's extremely unusual to get people at the, the opposite extreme. Um, but someone like uh, Anders Sandbo, for instance, and I use him as a case study by express uh, permission, as he says himself, uh, uh, I have a ridiculously high hedonic set point. Uh, it's not as though uh, he enjoys completely uniform bliss, but essentially, yes, his life is animated by intelligent, information-sensitive gradients of well-being. And in principle, it's possible to ratchet uh, uh, everyone up uh, to Anders' level of well-being uh, and beyond Anders uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to super well-being and, uh, and, and super bliss. Once again, as long as one has uh, this, as I said, informational sensitiv- sensitivity to good and bad stimuli, one can retain uh, critical insight, the capacity uh, for development, empathetic understanding. The enemy of intelligence and development, it's, it's, it's uniformity, whether uniform bliss or, or uniform misery. But the key here that I'm trying to drive is that you still must be able to retain the apparatus to be able to experience the full spectrum. In other words, yes, say Anders is... Uh, uh, you can perhaps ratchet Anders's hedonic point even higher, but in principle, he must remain capable of going in the opposite direction too. Um, because isn't it the same apparatus that allows for this to, to be experienced? Well, you can, for instance, have a complete nonsense mutation of the SCN9A gene, and this completely abolishes the capacity to feel uh, any form of of pain, and this uh, congenital analgesia, and this poses all sorts of health problems. Absolutely. Um, um, But once again, here technology comes to the rescue that if we want to in future, we can offload the nasty side of life uh, uh, onto smart uh, prostheses uh, when a silicon robot uh, sensors detect sulfuric acid being sprinkled uh, over its extremities. There is not the, the kind of the nasty raw feels of agony, but there is the functionality of withdrawing the limb. Uh, and likewise, in the long run, if we want to, we can offload such functionality such that your if your hand is just about to hit the hot stove, there is a, a, a very rapid withdrawal, presumably with a manual override so you don't feel you've lost control of your, of, of your body. Um, in the meantime, though, before we get to this level of transhumanist sophistication, the obvious partial solution is just to uh, give ourselves very high pain thresholds. As we know today, there are some people, they don't have congenital analgesia, but their pain thresholds are f- far, far higher than the rest of us, and they can function pretty normally. Can they experience pleasure completely in other words is there any impact on their pleasure sensitivity with the diminished pain sensitivity um uh, here here we uh i said this in in terms of bodily well-being i don't know how comprehensively uh uh uh, this is this has been researched um but yeah clearly what one wants to do is to phase out the nasty experiences whereas retain and amplify the good experiences. Now, now perhaps you, I mean, a, a counter argument here is that sh- surely these raw fields must play some functionally indispensable role. But if this were really the case, it would be an extraordinarily profound result. I mean, the consensus, as you know, in, in computer science and uh, information technology is that it's going to be possible to replicate uh, uh, the functionality of the human uh, uh, organism uh, in, silic- in silico. So if it really were the case that the raw textures uh, of unpleasantness were uh, uh, functionally indispensable, it would be an extraordinarily profound result. 
yeah and and that's that's what i'm trying to to figure out but but of course my perhaps wrong intuition is that it comes or it or maybe that's just uh years of of sort of brainwash training is that it comes as as a part of the package mm -hmm. and and people would say well we would be desensitized uh like a robot basically if you can't feel pain therefore intuitively speaking most of us would assume we would be incapable of feeling pleasure mm. we would be simply desensitized like robots mm. Well, I mean, already today, for instance, one can uh, take uh, empathetic euphorians, for instance, like MDMA ecstasy, which I said, it, given it's potentially neurotoxic, I don't uh, 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 recommend this, but this particular uh, uh, agent. But um, no, one shouldn't imagine that phasing out the biology of, of suffering is a, is, is a recipe for us becoming zombies. Uh, on, on the contrary, I think it should be possible to uh, uh, radically intensify uh, uh, the nature of experience. Indeed, I think it highly likely uh, post-humans, their intensity of awareness will compared to ours as, let's say, a glowworm to a, a supernova. Uh, so, no, uh, I don't think one should imagine this as somehow the zombification of humans. But when it comes to the nasty side of life, nasty uh, stimuli, yes, I think uh, temporarily at the, uh, for the uh, short-term future, we want to get them as, as, as minimal as possible and eventually phase them out. One doesn't want to heighten and enrich our capacity to uh, suffer. What about the impact this would have on, on the progress of our civilization? I mean, it's been said that all great accomplishments come after great suffering. And I mean, we started with the fact that you suffered and therefore perhaps that was part or the, the biggest part of the motivation for you trying to alleviate further suffering on a global scale. So isn't it true to say or, or what do you think of the saying that all great suffering, uh, I mean, all great accomplishments come after great suffering? Well, I mean, would would Deep Blue play uh, better chess if one uh, if it if it experienced fear when one put its king in check? Um, in the in, in in the case of, uh, of, of of silicon systems, one knows that this manifestly isn't the case. Um, as I said, in the case of organic robots, what is critical in terms of securing intellectual development and progress is to retain this informational uh, uh, sensitivity. Uh, yeah, sure, uh, if, 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 if we were talking about kind of uniformly blissed out rather than blissful, this certainly would be a, a threat to the, uh, the development of uh, the species and possibly uh, the future of uh, intelligent life in the universe. But uh, I would stress this is, this is not what we're talking about here. Uh, at least it's not sociologically realistic to imagine uh, that, that the future of life is us all uh, kind of wireheading or being on opioid drugs. Um, because, yes, that would be one route to uh, phasing out suffering altogether, but it's, it's, it's not realistic. There would be extremely strong selection pressure against wireheads or uh, heroin addicts uh, or something like this. Um, by contrast, by aiming to uh, recalibrate the hedonic treadmill, uh, intellectual progress can continue. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the hedonistic imperative. How is it similar or different from the abolitionist project? Hmm. Um, I confess I rather sacrificed my ethical seriousness uh, for the sake of a snappy title. Hedonistic imperative is obviously... Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to try and get you on that a little later, but let's get there first. Uh, but, uh, yes, uh, of course, this is a very big if, but if and when we do reach the stage where we have phased out suffering, experience below hedonic zero in both humans and non-human animals alike, and that later perhaps we can sketch out how it's possible in non-humans too, there is the question, should we be satisfied with uh, simply modest levels of well-being, you know, with information, a sensitive gradients of well-being that never falls below hedonic zero, but nonetheless is still within the normal bounds of experience today, or should we aim for radical super-happiness 
Uh, and if one looks uh, at the uh, yes, at the kind of molecular processes involved, there doesn't seem any reason why we can't radically uh, amplify our hedonic capacity. I don't think this is morally urgent in the way, same way uh, as phasing out suffering is is morally urgent. But a few centuries hence, I said this is a, going to be a very Big speculative if, okay, we have phased out all involuntary suffering, what then? Um, uh, are we really going to be satisfied with, fluctu- uh, with, with fluctuating around this sort of modestly, uh, this, this, this somewhat higher hedonic set point? Uh, or should one aim for, uh, yes, uh, gradients of sublime well-being? Uh, and regardless of your uh, ethical persuasion, uh, I, I think the default option should be, uh, yes, uh, uh, let's take this further. <laughs> mm-hmm. So would you say that uh, the abolitionist project's completion is in, in a way a prerequisite for the, uh, the, the hedonistic imperative? Yes, I mean, it's clearly, it's, I, th- I said, I think we have a responsibility to all other sentient beings. Uh, so it's not a case right now as one wants to uh, become as, as blissful as possible without regard uh, to the well-being or ill-being of others. I think one should be treating this uh, on a, uh, a global level. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and going back to the title now, uh, you said you, you had to sacrifice in order to get uh, sort of a catchy title. <laughs> now, hedonism has a sort of a bad vibe to it, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, if you, it's more if, like the empty pursuit of pleasure without any limit. It's, it can conjure up something rather amoral and shallow and yes. one-dimensional uh, hedonism. And you even have this expression, empty hedonism, too, uh, in practice, uh, if one enjoys states of sub- sublime well-being, they tend to be apprehended as, 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 as hyper-meaningful. It's depression that tends to seem empty and in severe cases almost nihilistic. But yes, the term hedonism, though some people may find it attractive, I think for a wider range of people, uh, it's, it, 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 yeah, it, it, they certainly would feel ambivalent about it. Uh, and yes, when I speak of uh, the hedonistic imperative, it's it's not a case of party, party, party hedonism. Not that mm-hmm. I've anything against parties, but uh, for me, just... the good sort of uh, 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 flavor of, of hedonism is Epicureanism, mm-hmm. uh, because that's that's where I draw the difference. Is that hedonism is kind of more meaningless and empty. Whereas Epicureanism is, is uh, you know, still pursuing pleasure, but in a much smarter way, uh, mm-hmm. in a much more sort of net positive way, if you will. Um, and, and speaking of Epicureanism, by the way, Epicurus was one of those people who allegedly was totally capable of being happy while suffering. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are reports uh, of his death. Uh, I can't remember what kind of cancer he was dying from or what kind of uh, condition. I think it was it had something to do with kidney cancer or kidney failure or something very painful. And he was supposedly dying in his bathtub or something like that and asked his students for a glass of wine and maybe some cheese or bread. But supposedly he was very happy and jovial until the very moment that he died, even during that that very painful process. What do you think of reports like that? Do you think it's possible for one to be happy while suffering? Uh, it has to be careful how one defines it. Someone with an extraordinarily high hedonic set point, for instance, uh, can maintain uh, cheerfulness in uh, adversity that would cripple the rest of us. Um, but uh, however much philosophical wisdom uh, one has, there are a very large number of people who simply uh, uh, could not uh, uh, endure a, a toothache with equanimity. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yes, this may well be true of 
and Epicurus, but uh, unfortunately, all too many people, their lives are blighted by uh, suffering of all kinds. And it's not life enriching. It doesn't make them better people. It's not ennobling or anything like that. It's just meaningless for the most part, at any rate. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, do you support the using of, that's another uh, audience question. Do you support using sex hormones, thyroid hormones, aromatase inhibitors, etc., in combo with psychotronics to improve well-being? Um, yes, uh, it needs to be done with considerable caution. Um, for instance, uh, testosterone is, uh, amongst other things, it's also uh, quite a, a powerful antidepressant and, and painkiller. But as we know, there's a, a great spectrum of uh, physiological and psychological effects uh, that come from enhancing one's native testosterone function. Uh, so, uh, yes, in principle, I support, but and this is going to sound lame, uh, one wants to read up as much as possible on the literature of possible uh, adverse side effects. Mm -hmm. Have you ever struggled with depression yourself, David? In the beginning, you said that people who are philosophers tend to be a little bit more introspective, more depressive. Mm. So I wonder if you have any putting aside the introspection. My, my, natural my natural default state, the sort of normal hedonic tone, would probably be a kind of chronic low-grade depression, not the you know, severe depression of some people who, who just don't feel like eating or anything like that. But yeah, if I didn't take a, a cocktail of moodiness, I, my life would be, you know, I would just be one of the innumerable walking wounded of life. Um, so, Mm -hmm. So, 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 what kind of psychotropics do you use, mm. uh, and and why? I mean, that's another audience question. What benefits have you noticed, and which ones would you advocate others to look into? Um, I think one needs to be. And apologies, there's a landline ringing in the background. I hope you can't hear it. I hope it will go away. Um, I personally take selegaline and aminectine. Uh, selegaline is also known as L-deprinol. It's a selective monoamino, monoamino, monoamino oxidase type. It uh, amplifies dopamine uh, uh, function. In multiple uh, animal models, uh, it tends to uh, increase uh, life expectancy, so it seems unlikely it's going to be doing one uh, any uh, a particular long-term damage that one doesn't know with human models. Uh, the other agent I take, uh, amineptin, uh, it's a, uh, a dopamine reuptake inhibitor uh, with weak noradrenaline uh, reuptake inhibiting properties. Um, I would only uh, suggest anyone contemplate taking either of these agents if they're at all prone to melancholic or retarded uh, depression and not uh, if they uh, are prone to anxiety or agitated depression. Uh, it's yeah, biochemical individuality is such that there isn't such a thing as the you know the the, the ideal regimen for everyone. There's a a lot of taboo in, in public opinion about the responsible use of psychotropics uh, to improve personal well-being. What do you think can be done or should be done about that? I think probably we want to highlight the inconsistencies of the people uh, who argue against uh, uh, the use of these agents and ultimately depending on one's metaphysical framework uh, admittedly uh, that uh, you and I are uh, a bunch of, of, of chemicals and therefore tweaking uh, these chemicals our molecular architecture it doesn't involve some radically new principle now clearly if you think that we're somehow made in uh, God's uh, image or for that matter you believe in the wisdom of, of, of mother nature nature and that humans are pretty much perfect as, as they are, then the idea with, of tampering, tampering with God's handiwork or interfering with Mother Nature is going to be an anathema. But I'm assuming that most of your audience are going to be uh, natural, <laughs> uh, a more naturalistic picture. 
And if one does, uh, yeah, just as the silicon robots, they can be upgraded, both their hardware, their firmware, and their software. Likewise, organic uh, uh, robots, too, uh, can be upgraded. Uh, at the back of a lot of people's mind, I think, is this dichotomy between the natural and the unnatural. But mm -hmm. we are so hypocritical. And, uh, of course, some of the most uh, yeah, kind of voluble critics of, uh, of, of, of taking these agents of transhumanism and technological uh, alternatives themselves, you know, they'll have all the latest uh, uh, gadgets. And, of course, they're, they're, they're going to be wearing clothes, which is profoundly un, uh, uh, unnatural. So, yeah, it's going to be a, a long-term process of persuasion, I think, Inevitably, younger uh, people, I suspect, are going to be more receptive than the older generation, though that's a sweeping generalization. But no, I don't have any instant snap uh, formula that will uh, win everyone over. <laughs> um, let me ask you this. What do you say to people who would say to you that you're just offering another, though hedonistic, type of utopia among many? Uh, I would first of all want to clarify uh, this, that by recalibrating the hedonic treadmill, it doesn't involve your giving up any of your core values or your existing preference architecture, unless that is your values are directly tied into the infliction of suffering. All that, uh, well, it's perhaps simplistic, but critically, what is involved in recalibrating the hedonic treadmill is simply that the quality of your life uh, is, is vastly enriched. I mean, certainly I wouldn't presume to be uh, telling anyone how they should be living their lives. It's not, uh, you know, uh, Dave's 10-point plan to save the world and tell you how to live your, live your life. It's, it's more a case, particularly in the case of, of, of creating new life too, of, of, of loading the genetic dice in favor of, of, of our children to make it much more likely uh, they'll have a high quality of life. So utopia, yes, you could say in one sense, but not, not a, a kind of a, a vision of a perfect society. It's not a, uh, an, an environmentalist utopia. I, I, I w I'm not sort of lay, trying to uh, say people that, you know, they should be living their life X, Y, and Z. Uh, I, I think... Perhaps too. Perhaps I should stress that it, it, it's a matter of, of of choice too. I mean, someone who is happy with their life as 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 it is, which may in, involve suffering. It's not a case of of, of, of coercive uh, of, of happiness. No one is going to be hauling you off to the pleasure chambers. Rather, it's a matter of ensuring that no one should be forced to uh, to suffer against their will. And this is what. Uh, te technology offers, whereas now, unfortunately, most people, it's it's completely involuntary. Much of, of, of their life will be spent in states of malaise. In future, it's going to be optional. And so, uh, yes, it's it's. I, I'm certainly not yes yeah, selling a, a, a utopia that uh, you know I would wish to uh, coerce people into joining. It, it's a matter of, of 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 opportunity and freedom to use two uh, uh, much abused words. Another one of my uh, audience uh, viewers, uh, who I know for, for a fact uh, is a vegan, C.M. Stewart, she's asking, when is killing a sentient being ever justifiable or acceptable now? And when is it ever justifiable or acceptable after the eradication of suffering that you propose? Hmm. Well... Right now, if, if there is a, a clear and irreconcilable conflict between two sentient beings, such as, let's say, uh, the Anopheles mosquito and humans, or for that matter, pigs, uh, I would prioritize uh, the interests of the more sentient being. Uh, being uh, an anti-speciesist, if you like, it's not a matter of saying that all sentient beings are equal. I, I certainly wouldn't wantonly tread on a fly or anything like that, but where there clearly is an irreconcilable conflict of interest, I think other things being equal, the interests of the, uh, the more sentient being must come first. Um, but I think, yeah, the critical criterion should not whether uh, the, the being is, is of one's own race or one's own species, 
it, it, it should be a, a, a sentience. So, yes, life is messy. We, 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 we all know this. And in, in certain cases, it's necessary to uh, harm other humans. In certain cases, it's necessary to harm uh, uh, non-human animals. But the long-term goal, uh, if you like, I think should be a kind of high-tech Jainism. Jainism is, is if, if, if you recall from India, Jains will, will, will sweep the ground in front of them rather than tread on a, a, a little in, uh, insect. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think most, of, most people in the West would regard this as, as faintly uh, uh, absurd. Um, uh, just uh, an interjection here, but compared to our uh, post-human successes, it may well be that that, that, that humans are as uh, insects compared uh, uh, to superhumans. So we better hope that they are uh, a, a Jains of a high-tech persuasion too. But but let me try and push you a little bit more here on the intraspecies conflict. Mm. Uh, when it's unclear... Uh, which one is is the higher sentience being? Uh, mm-hmm. Say, take two humans, for example, because it seems to me that you are kind of having a very sort of open utilitarianism where you do allow for, or, or do you, uh, for for murder or, or for, for killing of another human being. I shouldn't call it murder. I should say for killing of another human being under circum- certain circumstances. Mm. I think one needs to be careful with the uti- I think there are excellent indirect utilitarian grounds, for instance, for saying something like having an absolute prohibition uh, against uh, torture. Uh, 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 this might seem to uh, uh, run against utilitarian ethics, you know, the ticking bomb scenarios where one can imagine that torturing a terrorist or something could save dozens of lives. But a society in which torture is legal, it's likely to have spillover effects, will actually lead to worse consequences. So on indirect utilitarian grounds, uh, I think, uh, yes, we should uh, respect, wherever possible, the sanctity of life. We should have enshrined in law a prohibition against torture and, in some ways, implement the kinds of policies that are often associated with none uh, utilitarians. I think one needs to take a, a quite a sophisticated utilitarian approach. So many of the criticisms one hears of a utilitarian ethic are actually a revolve around the alleged bad consequences that would follow if utilitarian policies were, were, were pursued. But if a policy uh, leads to these bad consequences in terms of suffering, then it clearly isn't a utilitarian uh, policy initiative at all. Mm-hmm. So, but just to be clear, you do accept that there may be some circumstances where killing other humans may be justified? In practice, I, yes. I much, if you think of the, uh, the progress, such as it is, of civilization, uh, the state having a monopoly of violence rather than uh, private uh, individuals, I'm as near as one uh, comes to uh, a pacifist as is possible without being a pacifist. But yes, there are exceptional circumstances in mm-hmm. which violence may be uh, uh, unavoidable. We, we, we all know that, uh, that that life is messy. But other things being equal, as I said, I, I think the sanctity of life is, is a very good utilitarian principle because it, it, it promotes respect for other sentient beings. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. Now, let me ask you, that's, in a way, that's kind of a very Buddhist way of thinking. So where does Buddhism fit into the picture? Hmm. Or does it? I, in one sense, uh, clearly, uh, you could say that I am arguing a very Buddhist perspective because one doesn't need to persuade uh, a Buddhist that suffering and overcoming suffering is at the heart of our, uh, our ethical permission. Um, perhaps where I differ from most Buddhists is that the traditional Buddhist route to overcoming suffering, you know, the, the noble eightfold path, unfortunately, for these meditational disciplines and the like, they're not going to recalibrate the hedonic treadmill. They're certainly not going to dismantle the f- food chain and the cruelties of nature. If we want to phase out the biology of suffering, the only route ultimately to pursue is the biotechnological route. 
uh, which is not to say that there aren't all sorts of palliatives and Buddhists have been uh, pursuing them for, for thousands of years now. Uh, but if we're ethically serious about phasing out suffering, uh, yes, we have to embrace the very latest technology. Uh, perhaps I should uh, say by very latest, uh, it's not necessary to invoke anything like a, a Kurtzweilian uh, singularity or post-human superintelligence. It will be possible to uh, phase out suffering using recognizable extensions of existing uh, uh, technologies. But these are high-tech solutions. There's no getting at getting away from this. Um, We've mentioned the Kurtzwellian singularity several times by now, and I, I, perhaps this is the moment that I would ask you, what's your take on the technological singularity? I'm, I'm very skeptical that there's going to be uh, anything like a hard sing a singularity. Um, Ray Kurzweil is it 2045, the year humans are going to become immortal. That is uh, marketing genius, hats off. To him, uh, I can understand why he can get on the front cover of, of Time magazine. I don't think there is going to be a hard takeoff or anything like that. Um, are we heading for an era of post-human superintelligence? Yes, I think so. But I think it's going to be considerably later uh, than the year 2045. Uh, and I am skeptical that uh, organic robots are completely going to uh, merge with our machines uh, uh, for technical reasons. I think it's highly likely we will uh, retain our organic core for uh, the foreseeable future. Um, whereas some of, our, some of my transhumanist colleagues, for instance, believe in uploading uh, where essentially we're going to uh, uh, digitize and uh, uh, upload ourselves to our smart machines. Uh, and uh, even more radical in one sense than uh, Ray Kurzweil's vision is that of uh, uh, Miri, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, uh, who think it highly likely uh, that uh, a singleton AGI will essentially replace uh, humans and not in a friendly way too. Um, my own take on this uh, is that organic robots are going to be recursively uh, self-editing our, our own genetic source code and are going to be bootstrapping our way to post-human superintelligence uh, in combination with that of our, of our smart machines. And as our AI gets smarter, it can help us uh, to edit our uh, genetic source code in ever more sophisticated ways. Uh, if I wanted to give you know a, a snappy slogan, one could one could speak of of an organic uh, uh, singularity. But there's clearly a division within the transhumanist movement between those who imagine that uh, our successors will also be our biological descendants and those who think that humans will essentially be replaced. Now let let me take some of the issues here step by step. And so first of all. Let's say that uh, you're correct that perhaps Ray Kurzweil's timeline may be off by 2045. But does that really matter in philosophical terms? I mean, I the way I look at it as a philosopher myself is this. The timeline is merely a detail. The more important is the general trend. So would it happen or wouldn't it happen? And if if it would happen in 2045 or 2095 or 2145, it doesn't really make a difference in the grander scheme of things. Uh, and, and then the issue becomes not one of timeline or time frame, but more one of feasibility. So what do you think would be the impediments from this to happen? First, I would say I agree with you that it's the principle that is most interesting but from a marketing perspective if one wants to get people interested in the idea and the technology if, if you tell them it's going to happen uh, to, uh, 2090 they'll think well I'm going to be dead <laughs> then it, it to, to keep people's interest one has to convince them somehow it's going to happen in their lifetime uh, I mean, what could be more cruel than to try to interest people in radical life extension than to tell them that we're going to find a cure for aging perhaps 10 years after you're dead? Um, so from a marketing perspective, it's critical to pitch any kind of dates uh, uh, within the lifetime of a prospective of, of audience. Um, 
Um, but in terms of feasibility, well, I've got a, a confession here. I'm probably in a minority here. I do not think a classical digital computer is ever going to be sentient, a, a subject of, of, of experience. I think uh, that uh, classical digital computers will, yes, they will become faster and faster and ever more uh, sophisticated and multifunctional. But I don't uh, think uh, awareness or consciousness is going to switch on. I don't think they're ever going to solve the phen phenomenal binding problem. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, I I I in that sense, I think uh, organic minds are different. Mm -hmm. And why? <laughs> why? Why would we never be able to bridge that difference? Mm. I think it comes down uh, to your analysis of how it's possible uh, for organic minds to solve the binding problem. The binding problem, uh, if anyone hasn't come across it before, is how is it possible uh, that a distributively processed edges, textures, motions, and so on in your mind brain are somehow combined into phenomenal objects and those phenomenal uh, uh, objects, you apprehend them as part of a, a phenomenal field that in itself contains multiple dynamic objects. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now, in some sense, you are a unitary subject of experience. How that is, is possible for supposedly discrete classical nerve cells, not just to be uh, 100 uh, billion uh, bits of atomic mind dust, but at least when one is awake or, or, or dreaming, uh, sometimes, uh, yes, this unitary subject of experience is completely unexplained. Um, by analogy, I mean, think of the population of, the, you know, the United States, for instance. Here you have 320 million odd skull bound minds. However, they're interconnected, and let's assume that their connectivity can be sharpened and it can be made ever more sophisticated and functional. You're still going to have three, uh, 320 skull bound uh, American minds. Uh, and okay, when you say, how do you know that it's not going to be possible at some time in future that the population of the United States becomes a single subject of experience? Um, the answer is, I don't. But if that happens, it's inconsistent with reductive physicalism and the ontological unity of science. I mean, there is, in fact, uh, uh, a, uh, a philosopher, philosopher, Eric, and I'm going to mispronounce his name. He's got a, a German, Germanic sounding name starting with an S, actually has a paper entitled, If Materialism is True, uh, the United States is Probably uh, uh, Conscious. Um, but anyway, the, the point of this analogy was it is as uh, miraculous and unexplained the fact that you and I are subjects of experience as it is as if the United, the United States were uh, a subject of experience. And another way to highlight just how extraordinarily computationally powerful this capacity for phenomenal binding is, is to look at cases when phenomenal binding breaks down, where the cases of so-called motion blindness, where someone has a neurological accident uh, and they can no longer detect motion. They will see a car uh, in one place and then, then nearer them and then nearer again, but they don't apprehend motion. Or simultaneagnosia, where they can literally only see one object at once. Uh, or florid schizophrenia and the complete breakdown of, of unitary personality. As I said, extraordinarily uh, computationally powerful. Organic robots, uh, yes, apparently do this effortlessly most of the time. I have uh, my own ideas how this may be uh, possible. I should say in advance I'm uh, a quantum mind uh, 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 person. But uh, yes, uh, 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 one shouldn't just take it as read that uh, a classical serial digital computer at some stage in the future that uh, consciousness or phenomenal binding is just going to mysteriously switch on. So what do you think of the hammer of Penrose uh, model of quantum consciousness then? <laughs> I'm extremely uh, skeptical for all sorts of uh, reasons. 
uh, uh, Penrose as 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 uh, I said, a brilliant uh, mathematician. Uh, he has what the, the French uh, uh, call, and apologies for my uh, terrible fr- French pronunciation, uh, deformation pr- professional. I mean, he's a mathematician, and he thinks that consciousness somehow gives us the capacity to compute non-computable, fun- or rather, mathematicians to compute non-computable functions, or something like that. Whereas in evolutionary terms, it's extremely difficult. Uh, to make sense of anything like that. What possible uh, uh, selective advantage could uh, uh, this have conferred? Um, I think one needs to look very much at the other end of the phylogenetic tree. I, th- I think the, the mind brain has been a, a quantum computer for the past 540 uh, a million odd uh, years. And one, yes, needs to be looking at uh, phenomenal binding and our capacity to run multimodal uh, 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 world simulations in almost real time, extraordinarily fast, uh, 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 computationally powerful. This is why even a bumblebee is 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 is, is far more sophisticated than DARPA's finest uh, 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 even now. <laughs> so um, the, the, there are other problems uh, uh, too with the Hammeroff uh, Penrose model. It depends on. Uh, uh, a quantum coherence being sustained at what, on the face of it, uh, is extraordinarily long uh, timescales and environment as 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 as, as warm and uh, apparently noisy as as the brain. Uh, it involves uh, the, the notorious so-called collapse of the wave function, uh, and I don't think there is any evidence that uh, uh, wave functions really collapse. This is. Uh, uh, it's it's a non uh, a physical notion. So yes, I'm extremely skeptical of the Hammer of Penrose model. Um, but uh, Hammer of Penrose, Penrose uh, this does not exhaust quantum mind hypotheses. Um, it's, it's it's worth um, uh, uh, Max Tegmark why the mind brain is probably not a quantum computer. Um, and Tegmark points out that any uh, kind of plausible uh, decoherence timescale uh, is on the level of picoseconds. And uh, he takes it as read that this is a kind of reductio ad absurdum of quantum mind models. But I don't regard this as a reductio ad absurdum. I would say let's assume that quantum uh, mind uh, 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 critic Max Tegmark is correct. What, it would, what would it be like to instantiate uh, a, uh, a quantum computer uh, uh, that was running at 10 to the power 13 quantum coherent frames a second, computationally optimized by uh, millions of years of evolution? Um, well, you're probably uh, a couple of uh, objections to mind. Uh, 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 an obvious objection would be, well, look, surely we uh, perceive our local environment with a, uh, a delay of uh, scores of milliseconds, not picoseconds. Uh, it's uh, absurd. Um, but I think this uh, objection would rely on a false theory uh, of perception. Uh, it's not the case that one directly apprehends one's external environment. Uh, rather that when one is uh, awake rather than dreaming, it is the environment that is selecting uh, uh, states of the mind brain. I mean, after all, one knows from one's uh, dreams that one's mind brain is creating uh, uh, these the, the, these world simulations. The difference is that when one is awake rather than dreaming, uh, one's world simulation tends to causally co-vary uh, uh, with the local environment. So that's one a priori objection one can uh, 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 one can. Uh, dismiss. Um, now, clearly, if this conjecture that uh, quantum coherence uh, it explains uh, phenomenal binding, um, yes, there is a testable prediction here that when our uh, experimental apparatus is of sufficient sensitivity to detect quantum, macroscopic quantum coherence in the brain, we will find not just the noise phenomenologically and computationally irrelevant noise, as intuitively one might expect, I predict that one would actually find the formal structural analogues of the macroscopic objects of one's phenomenal world. I said that is a uh, a testable uh, uh, prediction. And uh, uh, yes, so many uh, theories of mind and consciousness, there's a a real shortage of uh, testable predictions. 
that I said I, I, I should flag if, if uh, for any of your listeners. Now, clearly, I'm you know, way out on a limb here, and of course, this uh, conjecture may be uh, may, may, may may be falsified. Mm-hmm. David, we are approaching uh, the end of our interview, so let me ask you the last three or four questions here. What is your greatest fear? My own personal uh, 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 greatest fear is that some form of multiverse uh, is correct, whether uh, Everett's conception or inflationary cosmology or something like that, uh, in that I am cautiously optimistic uh, that sometime within the uh, next few hundred years, the world's last experience below uh, hedonic zero in our forward light cone is going to occur. But within the context of a larger reality, I fear it may be the case that there are inconceivable many uh, Everett branches where Darwinian life, pain and suffering goes on indefinitely. Uh, if something like the inflationary, eternal inflation is true, very, very speculative, then it's not really the case that one is going to be phasing out suffering. Uh, cosmology is in a state of flux, and I would very much like to think that reality is is smaller than I uh, I fear. But in, in these uh, uh, debates, unfortunately, I, I am just a, 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 an educated layman and spectator. We'll, we'll see how the theoretical cosmology pans out. And what's your greatest dream or biggest inspiration? Biggest inspiration? Um, The biggest dream, perhaps. (laughs) Clearly, uh, I would like to see uh, heaven on earth uh, for all creatures, uh, great and small. Uh, It is, in that sense, uh, not uh, uh, exceptionally different from a, a, a dream that people have had uh, throughout history, it's just that yeah, uh, uh, we now have tentative evidence that it's going to be technically feasible. Uh, and certainly once we have done literally everything we can to get rid of suffering uh, from the world, and I say abolish it from our forward light cone, I hope we can forget about its uh, uh, very existence uh, and then uh, go on to the maximal degree of, uh, of, of flourishing for all sentient beings. That's what you refer to as paradise engineering. Paradise engineering, yes. <laughs> okay. What's the best place for people to find more about you and your work? Mm. Well, if you go to, let's say, abolitionist.com, abolitionist.com, you'll have a, a quite a crisp synopsis of uh, the uh, the abolitionist project many many years ago when the the web was young and before we knew which, how, which way things were going to go I set up headweb.com h e d w e b dot com headweb.com which is, is if you like the motherload site I have a little family of sites um, but yes if you're interested in the particular strand of, of transhumanism that focuses on uh, uh, yes, the pleasure pain axis and, and radical enhancements there. Uh, yeah, that's uh, what I would focus on. Um, for people who are more interested in uh, super longevity or super intelligence, there are other, other sites, not my sites in particular, I could uh, 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 recommend. But yeah, if your focus is on uh, suffering and what I've talked about, and it does strike some kind of chord, abolitionist.com. David, we've been talking for well over an hour now. So what's the most important thing that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from our conversation today? A single message, perhaps, that you want to send out there in the universe? Good question. Um, In terms of one's own life, as soon as one starts thinking about one's great, one's place in the, you know, great place, uh, place in the great scheme of things, yes, one can feel utterly insignificant and probably most of us are. But at the very least, I think one wants to do no harm. Uh, And I would urge someone who does think that it's a good idea for us to uh, phase out suffering uh, by uh, giving up uh, eating meat, uh, which uh, if one investigates the conditions of 
uh, factory farming. Uh, the fact that pigs and other non-human animals are comparable to uh, at, at small children, uh, yes, it is a crime against sentience on an almost unimaginable scale. And yes, that is what uh, I would urge uh, a meat eater to do and to try and persuade uh, their friends to do likewise. Uh, you said one, I'm going to say two. Um, uh, uh, the, second, uh, the second thing I would urge, whether it's a case of one, if one is planning to have children or if it's a case of grandchildren advising your uh, existing children, rather than uh, playing the standard genet genetic roulette, to consider using pre-implantation genetic screening diagnosis. Um, and although it still uh, it exists only in quite crude forms, simply by choosing a handful of variant alleles, you can load the genetic dice in favor of your prospective children. And if enough people decide to do this and this becomes the norm, there will be selection pressure against so many of the nasty traits that are endemic to Darwinian life. David Pierce. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you.